Awesome. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm super excited to be in a room full of people trying to build a stronger country. It's a great place to be. So I'm the founder and CEO at Propel. Um, and I came to the United States from China with my parents when I was four years old. Um, grew up in a loving and supportive household uh, that had a lot of laughs and a lot of happiness, but also had a lot of financial challenges. And so I think like a lot of American families ran into times where we couldn't consistently put food on the table. I was uh, fortunate to go to college on a financial needs scholarship where I learned how to code and eventually landed a few jobs in tech companies. But I was, um, especially in consumer tech, spent a lot of time thinking about how founders solve the problems that they personally understand. And that a lot of the mass market apps and websites used by millions of people throughout this country are built to solve the needs of middle to higher income folks because those are the people who generally have access to entrepreneurship and have access to starting software companies. And then in particular, the consumer software industry in Silicon Valley didn't really seem like it was solving the problems of people like my parents when I was growing up. So in 2014, I left my job in tech to do a fellowship at a nonprofit in Brooklyn focused on building software for low income families with this idea that you could take the playbook of Silicon Valley tech and apply it to solve some of the challenges of low-income families. That's how I learned about the social safety net. I spent a lot of time applying for benefits, learning about how to use public benefits in this country. I learned about the SNAP program, which is more commonly known as food stamps. The SNAP program is going to distribute about $100 billion in, in food stamp benefits to low-income families in 2022, and, and those benefits are distributed on the EBT card. The EBT card is a debit card that a state government puts in the hands of low-income families. And I found out about this crazy quirk about the EBT card, that when you get an EBT card and you go grocery shopping, you need to figure out exactly how much is left on your card so you know how much food you can buy. You generally call the 1-800 number on the back of the card to see what your balance is. And when I learned about this fact in 2014, my brain kind of like short-circuited um, because it seemed insane to me that there was $100 billion of taxpayer money that was being put on these programs, and it's this incredibly important program that is literally standing in the way of tens of millions of Americans going hungry, and yet the last mile of that program, the software user experience of what it's like to actually use that program to get food on the table is that you call this 1-800 number, which is not the way that anyone spends money on a debit card or a credit card through the private sector. So very naively, um, I went to state governments and I talked to state administrators who were in charge of these programs and I said, hey, I really think you should build a smartphone app that's similar to what private sector banks and financial services companies have. And I was promptly laughed out of the room. Um, and I came to realize that a lot of the state administrators who are really great public servants really think of their core job as program administration with a capital P and a capital A. It's really focused on um, you know, the paperwork and the forms and the RFPs and the processes and the fraud metrics and all these things. And that the software experience was kind of this edge case, it was kind of a rounding error for a lot of people running these programs. And I just personally couldn't disagree more that I really felt that, you know, as I learned about this program, that the experience of checking your EBT balance is probably the most common interaction that low-income households have with the entire government. And so making that a dignified and modern experience is worth a lot. So I was in this position of, you know, being really fired up, wanting to solve this problem, but being told explicitly no by the state administrators that they, this was not a priority for them. So it led me to explore this concept of public interest technology. And I love that this morning, uh, Catherine let us off with the examples of how private companies can work with government, that it's not all sales. Um, public interest technology I define as a non-government entity that helps government to solve problems in the public interest, but without signing contracts or making money through the public sector. It requires government to be a provider of data and appropriate safeguards. And it requires entrepreneurs to figure out our own business model because we're not making money through the public sector. We're definitely not the first company to try this model. Um, if you look at industries like tax or the administration of PPP or enrollment in, in ACA benefits, you know, there are companies that, are, that are, are layering on top of these user experiences and making these public services a lot easier for consumers to use. So this is really the model that we tried to apply to human services and the safety net through Propel. So my company's called Propel, and Propel is a company that solves a small problem so that we may get the opportunity to solve a much bigger problem. The small problem that we solve is that nobody wants to call the freaking 1-800 number to see what their balance is on the EBT card. Um, and so when we were starting the company, we, we learned that actually state governments contract with payment processors to produce these public-facing websites where any EBT cardholder can log in using their username and password and see their balance in transaction history. That actually these websites are mandated by state contracts, but they're not mandated to be marketed, they're not mandated to be well-built, they're not mandated to work on smartphones. 
So the way that our backend works is that we gain, uh, we gain permission from our users to act as their agents, to log into these websites, to pull that information into our app and to show it in sort of a modern and respectful way. So that's the small problem that we solve at Propel. The much bigger problem that we solve is that poverty is sticky, that there are 90 million Americans who make under $40,000 per year, that if you graduate from the food stamp program, 70% of people will go back on the program in the next two years. And the, it's not clear to me that these types of problems around poverty being sticky are necessarily purely public sector ones. That for a lot of low-income families, they're also navigating private sector financial services. They're navigating all sorts of different private sector services as well. And so I think really it's the combination of the public, nonprofit, and private sectors that can actually make a dent in this problem. So here's what we do. We're the creators of the Providers app, which is used by over 5 million families across the country each month to manage their SNAP benefits and money. The app is entirely free for our users and for any public sector entities. There are about 20 million households in the United States who get SNAP benefits, so we're currently used each month by about a quarter of all Americans who get SNAP. And this is what I mean by solving the small problem in order to have the chance to solve this much larger problem. Um, solving the much larger problem is actually how we make money as a company. So uh, let me give you a few examples of that. The first is that we help to, uh, people to stretch their SNAP benefits through savings on grocery. We uh, work directly with grocery merchants and grocery brands to publish coupons inside of our app that allow people to get savings on their food stamp benefits. Um, this is incredibly important for people who don't generally have enough to eat. Um, and it's really something that we see as a win-win-win because our users are often walking through grocery stores using our app, thinking about how much food they can buy. It's a great chance for grocery retailers and brands to compete for the business of those folks. Secondly, we've helped over 200,000 families get access to cheap or free home internet and cell service, oftentimes uh, through, through federally subsidized programs. We were named by the White House as a community partner in the launch of the Affordable Connectivity Program this summer, and we've been a marketing channel for ISPs to be able to reach low-income families with a discounted or free home internet program. As we all know, broadband is such an incredible, important thing in 2022. And thirdly, we help our users to find different types of jobs. So over the last few years, we've helped about 500,000 people who are using SNAP benefits to get jobs. And we publish all sorts of jobs, whether it's on-demand, seasonal, part-time, or full-time. And we are paid by employers as a marketing channel to help them fill these vacancies. So these are just some of the examples of ways in which we make money by helping our users solve the major financial problems that they encounter. But there is kind of a deeper financial problem that a lot of low-income families deal with, which is that the, the account that holds their money, the bank that they use, tends to hold them back from actual financial growth. In some cases, it's the kind of truly negative case of punitive fees and people being, being taken, um, taken advantage of by payday lenders. But even in the other cases, um, it, it's really that the financial, services is, uh, the financial services sector is at best neutral for a low-income family. It's a generic holder of money. It's not something that actually helps you take steps forward or to get out of poverty. And so that's why we built the Providers Card, which is the first checking account and debit card really focused on low-income families who use social safety net benefits. We're the only bank in the country that treats uh, payments from the state or federal government, things like the unemployment program or the disability program or, or a tax credit, as a first-class citizen, as a primary way that people might put money into th their accounts. And we built a whole set of features focused on making it easier for people to go navigate those programs. We're the only uh, checking account and debit card in the country that knows your socioeconomic status because this is a debit card that's bundled in for free with the app that helps you manage the SNAP program. We, can, we know that 100% of our users are getting SNAP benefits. And that's useful because there are philanthropies who want to give money to people that are verified as being low income. And so we can direct that cash very easily into the pockets and to the checkbooks of low income families. In the last few months, uh, we've We've done about $3 million in cash grants in Q3 of this year. And finally, it's really been our, our, our hope to build this from the ground up as a thing that is really meant for low-income families. And so we've done things like hired a customer support team of people who use the Providers app previously, people who are using public benefits, um, so that when you call us because you've got a problem in your finances, you speak to someone who knows how to navigate the safety net because they've done it on their own. And so despite our progress, we really uh, wouldn't be here without you know, the partnership and help of all different types of sectors. We're only able to do the work that we do in partnership with cities, states, and federal agencies who administer programs. 
We rely on policymakers to fund programs like SNAP and the child's uh, tax credit with the Farm Bill coming up in 2023. We see lots of opportunities to, mo to move forward these programs through technology. And we're currently working with the CFPB to give EBT cards the same data rights that are given to Americans who use checking accounts and other types of financial products, and we'd love uh, support on that. So the challenge of helping tens of millions of Americans to get out of poverty is just, I think, simply too big for any one organization to solve. But with the efforts of, of public servants of the nonprofit sector and a public interest technology, I think it's something that we can really make a dent on. Thank you.